Fanatics has the ability to build a platform that can be everything for the fan. And they can express and live their fandom in that ecosystem. I'm not just building another sports book. One that's slightly faster or slightly prettier or has a slightly better UX. Building an ecosystem here so that fans can actually express their fandom for sports. And sometimes it's the non-sexy work that has the biggest impact. Yeah, yeah well, we're, we're definitely better rolling up our sleeves and making clients look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also curious about the Star Trek conventions. I've never attended one. <laughs> hear about the oh, I, the last one, I, I got it. I got a tattoo. A little uh, Klingon, uh, Klingon uh, symbol. Uh, yeah. 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 I, <laughs> So today we'd like to welcome Ian Botts, uh, CTO of Fanatics Betting and Gaming. Uh, Ian, I'm pretty sure our audience knows uh, quite a few. Uh, quite a few folks know you. Um, please tell us about yourself. Oh, well, hi. Thank you, by the way, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, again, Ian Botts, um, CTO of Fanatics Betting and Gaming. Um, I've been with the company since it uh, was sort of first uh, founded. I've been here about two years. Um, Previous to that, um, my first sort of full way into the sportsbook world um, was leading engineering uh, and technology for Fangel um, at the beginning of the sort of sportsbook uh, universe um, as far as like it, it being part of the United States. I don't have a long history uh, in sportsbooks as an iGaming in general. Um, so really, my career is about as old as it's sort of been legal in the United States uh, to do it. So it's been an incredibly eye-opening journey. Um, I have a very unique background um, in the sense that I didn't come from sort of like your traditional technology background for, for, for good or for bad. Uh, sort of, I think it's up to the eye of the beholder there. Um, I came from a non-sort uh, of technical universe. Um, I came from a social economic um, climate where college um, wasn't necessarily something in the vocabulary, it was nothing that was ever presented to me as a possibility and there was definitely no way to pay for it. So um, I kind of went into the job market and uh, I was very lucky sort of starting off at customer service and operations in the 1990s. So the, the beginning of the internet uh, sort of uh, revolution, working sort of help desk fields, this quasi technical world where I was introduced to people that made some investments in me and I was able to um, start taking shifts, working in the knock at night, learning how to build network tables and understanding telephony and network routing tables and sort of give this sort of practical hands-on experience, experience through mentorship, um, which opened up a path to then allow me to start learning how to code, become a software developer and get me my first really big professional sort of career job working at Microsoft. Um, where I spent about seven years at Microsoft in various capacities um, in both in quality engineering as well as software engineering. Um, that took me over to Vulcan Technologies, where I became a director of engineering over there um, through my mentor at the time, John Lazarus, um, someone who was very good, who spent a lot of time sort of sponsoring and mentoring me. Um, and he was actually um, early on um, sort of conjoled me, pushed me, encouraged me, I don't know, picked me out, uh, and got me over to Amazon. Uh, at that time, Amazon was a uh, uh, just a retailer, like e-retailer. I had very little interest. I was a really cool thing that involved in with Paul Allen and that sort of, you know, a group of startup companies, think tank research, a lot of AI, machine learning. I um, mean, it's sort of like the earliest universe. Um, but I got, I, I, I followed his advice, pushing, insistence, you know, got Lazarus. Difficult guy to say no to. Anyway, ended up at Amazon. I spent 10 years very successful at Amazon for so much for uh, going over there sort of reluctantly. 10 years disappeared. I found myself at a vice president level um, at Amazon. Worked on some amazing projects. Um, the first generation of the Kindle Fire tablet, um, Fire TV, which was a hack day project. Fire phone, which was the, one of the biggest colossal phone failures in the market, so the top three. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, click all copy winners, a uh, little redemption with Alexa uh, and working in that space, the Amazon Go store finally audible. So a great 10 year run. Uh, at the end of that, I had a decision to make. Um, uh, so the self-imposed decision, but I had a question about, well, it wasn't a decision, let's put it this way. It was a question I had to answer. And that was, was I successful because of Amazon 
or was Amazon successful because of me? When I joined the company, there were less than 30,000 employees, including all the warehouse workers. When I left, it was 1.1 million employees. Uh, at Amazon, they have a tool uh, called the Old Fault Tool. Uh, there was a number of URLs in front of my uh, my my name about like what percentile I was in, as far as like you know long time old fault Amazon Amazonians. So I realized quite quickly you can't answer that question by staying in situ, and so I made the decision to leave Amazon uh, and sort of go out and try my hand at other places, and that's how I found the sports betting world. A world I did not expect to be in ever. Um, a world that I had a ton of bias against. Uh, one, it was sports, um, and I'm a classic nerd. Sports in me, like that, did, that didn't seem like a thing. And then, of course, you know, sort of the the, the worst parts that we would think about as technology, like you know, uh, intersection of like programmer, sports programmer. Um, and what I found was actually a group of really intelligent people working on incredibly difficult problems in a space that is monumentally difficult. And I fell in love with it. Uh, we got Fadual up to be number one sports book in the US. Um, it still is today. And uh, found myself uh, working with Matt King. And uh, I decided to leave the company after it fully sold the Flusser. And I didn't expect to do another stint at a sports book, but here I am, uh, launching again from scratch. This time, uh, we're hoping second mover advantage is the same. But uh, what a story. <laughs> it's different. It's different. I got to meet some incredible people along the way. So it's been yeah, it's Amazon been... into, uh, you know, to the sports world. It's great. Uh, yeah. It's an inspiring story for, for people to, you know, for kids coming up, you know, for There's all sorts of different ways, right, Kevin, to get to the same objective. Like I could have done this through college. I was lucky that there was uh, some people that made that, that didn't just mentor me, they sponsored me, right? They took an investment, they made a personal investment in me and gave me opportunity, an opportunity to fail. And believe me, I've had some colossal failures as well along this journey. But it's there's different paths through, and I think it doesn't, you don't, it, if you're one of those kids that are sitting there like either college is such a stretch or you're not doing well in college, it doesn't mean you're not going to be a good software engineer or a good leader. That's just, means there's a different path for you to take. And uh, I think me personally, I think as a as a society, we need to be a little better in embracing all sorts of different routes, routes to the endpoint. Because in the end, especially in our industry, it's about your ability to express yourself in code, to demonstrate your skill set, not necessarily how you acquired the skills. So it could be no different if you could acquire the skills from YouTube or you can acquire the skills from Harvard. I'm not necessarily sure there's a delta between the two when it comes to the actual interview day. Um, and so, like, you know, I think that there's a lot more opportunity than sometimes people think in that kind of a rigid mindset when it comes to how to solve a problem. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and you, you took that path before it was cool to take that path. <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah, right to say. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Trust is out of the ring. Why not sort of show? Oh, yeah. So, you landed at Fanatics. Um, you, you're kind of going through uh, what you went through at, at Fandle. Um, a little, little bit of a different because you know Fandle had, had a little bit of a of a backing with um, you know Betfair and and, and Flutter there, and uh, Fanatics is uh, you know being a, the conglomerate that it is on, on the retail side. There, there's no. I would say uh, you know history right with, with with sports betting, so it's really kind of a you know, grassroots, you know, ground up build for you. Um, yeah. Well, what, what were some of the, uh, challenges, uh, for you to kind of, you know, get in there, figure out what, you know, fanatics want to do as a company and also your vision for the product. Well, so I think the, the, what did fanatics want to do with the, with the, with the, with the product or like, what are they, what was their strategic goals is what brought me to, to fanatics. So yeah. Like, let's be clear, like, you know, it, it, on the surface of it, it sounds like madness, right? Like, uh, you build the number one uh, product in the category, then you step away and go build another product. And you're like, well, why, why would you do that? You, you did it. You got the number one product in the category. Um, and then don't get me wrong, I have great friends over at FanDuel, and FanDuel is a great product. But when I sit there and I fundamentally started looking at the sports betting industry in the United States, and it's very different than the sports betting industry in Europe, right? Um, when I started looking at it in the United States, 
I, I have a hard time on it. If I'm just being really honest, and I sort of step away, it's very difficult to see what the difference is between the different books. Right, it's a duopoly right now. Right, the vast majority of the the lion's share of the industry is is Fandle and DraftKings. They're warring with each other for the number one spot. I know DraftKings has been um, definitely like moving forward and sort of you know threatening Fandle a little bit more than it has in the last couple of years. But I, fundamentally, when I go to their products and I look at the products, I see very little differentiation between them. And I think consumers are seeing the same thing. Most consumers in this industry, especially in the United States, are what I would consider a promiscuous user. They're users that have accounts in multiple books, and they know mostly what they're going to bet on for the weekend. And they're looking to see who has the best promotion, or who has the best odds boost, or who has the best incentive to get their share of the wallet. And I think you're seeing that it's very difficult for books to be profitable, right? Because they have to be so aggressive with their marketing, so aggressive with their bonusing. Because it really, you can place the same bet kind of everywhere, right? Um, I think Fandle's great success has been that it's got a clean UX. Um, it achieved availability really early, right? So sort of you know, key principle, like people are gonna put money um, on deposit with you, probably be available. For them to be able to get hold of it, um, and they've been really secure. No one's they've had no knock on wood, and I hope they don't. They've had no security breach either, right? So they've been secure, they're reliable, they're available, they're fast, and um, they got a clean UX. I think that's what their secret source is and why they're winning right now because it's not product differentiation. What sold me about Fanatics and to do this again is the concept of a second mover advantage, right? And like there's examples littered throughout. The, the annals of technology about what is a second move for advantage. Spotify is a great one. If you thought about who was going to win the streaming wars a while back, it was Pandora, right? Like that was, a, that was the experience music project that turned into Pandora. Pandora was winning everywhere. And then, you know, these nerds out of Sweden showed up with instant streaming with no lag and they destroyed Pandora. You barely hear about them anymore, right? Spotify is the juggernaut. And that's a sort of second mover advantage. Box did it for cloud storage. They took it and made it very simple. Everyone had a cloud storage product. Box was the one that my mom could use, right? And so Box became big. So you see these second mover advantages. Fanatics, I think, is really poised with its collection and its region of sports in the sports world to really provide um, a platform to build an ecosystem where fans, right, for now, you know, actual sports fans can express their fandom in a way that they can't do today anywhere else. And iGaming and sports books is one part of that sort of larger but burgeoning ecosystem. So like you sit back and you kind of like really think about it, right? Um, so many places in our culture um, really celebrate their fans, right? And I think the best example of that is nerd culture, which I'm steeped in. Uh, uh, but nerd culture really loves fandom. Um, so you see that expressed at Comic Con, right? And the rise of like shows like The Big Bang Theory, which celebrated nerds who celebrated their fandoms. They dressed up as their favorite characters. We've got a movie franchise that has done so many billions of dollars, right? Which are all playing to those fans. And their fans can indulge and live out their fantasies, right? They can be Iron Man, they can be Spider Man, right? And it's and it's these amazing stories that are being told. And you can go to a convention. I've been to multiple Star Trek conventions, for example, right? And they pan to the man can meet my sports heroes. When you think about sport, however, sport is probably the most the I think the biggest pastime in America. That probably the thing that still unites us, even though we're tribal inside of sports, it unites us as a people. Because we can all appreciate a good play, be it you know the beautiful game in in in, in football with the feet, um, or American football and amazing pass. Right, like it can be this really magical moment. It brings everyone together, but there isn't really an ecosystem to truly express your fandom. There's different things. You go place a bet. You can go buy a a, a jersey. You can go to the game. Right. Um, but we're starting to see that change. Like, look at the draft. The draft has become so big now, the NBA draft, the NFL draft. 
yeah. who's going where, like the the shirts and speculation. It's become a show, right? Um, and people get excited for it. Well, fanatics has the ability to build a platform that can be everything for the fact. And they can express and live their fandom in that ecosystem. So the first example, and we have a long roadmap ahead, and I'm not going to give you all our secrets, but the first simple example of that um, is two things that we integrated immediately from day one for our launch. Number one being fan ID. So one single login, one ID that spans the entire Fanatics ecosystem, right? You can use that same credentials to shop on NFL. Uh, shop.com or on fanatics.com or any one of the other uh, big franchises or team shops. You can go to uh, the commerce site, you can buy trading cards and collectible items. You could come to betting and gaming. You could place bets. So now you have one ID, one tag that it, you can now express yourself right in sort of all these different properties. The second one was coming up with a, uh, with a currency that was common across the organization. So we have fan cash. And you have the ability through your normal activities to earn fan cash, and fan cash is dollars, and it's pegged to the U.S. dollar. So one dollar of fan cash is worth one real U.S. dollar. Um, but you can you can earn fan cash through everything from buying a hat at Lids, buying a team jersey, buying your little league uh, outfits, right? Because we provide those as well. Um, to getting traded cards, garbage pail kids, to buying a signed baseball, um, and then to finally now. For every bet you make, win or lose. If you make a bet with Fanatics, you get one, three, and five percent uh, fan cash and earnings. And obviously, you can imagine that some of those that might be some uh, opportunity for some uh, big days out there were to earn fan cash. And then that fan cash can be spent across the ecosystem. So that currency now is beginning to sort of like have this sort of great sort of attraction. And again, start getting customers into this ecosystem. We have a long roadmap ahead of us. And I think what we'll see is over the next 12, 18, 24 months, ecosystem that is as rewarding and as overloaded with value like Prime is, like Amazon Prime, where as a sports uh, uh, fan, you can go and get everything that you need and want and desire from one set of apps, one main, you know, front app, and all the way across that ecosystem. And to me, that's really exciting, right? It means that I think once a user is in that ecosystem and earning that fan cash, kind of like um, your rewards points for your airline miles, you're not going to go want to fly on another airline. You're not going to go want to pet on another book, even if they got some an odds boost or a thing that might be better because you want to generate your points. You want your fan cash because you know that at the end of the year, you use that money to buy, put jerseys under the tree, Christmas tree, right? And it's so valuable. So it, to me, this is... This is the vision that excited me about coming back in. I'm not just building another sports book, one that's slightly faster or slightly prettier or has a slightly better UX. Building an ecosystem here so that fans can actually express their fandom for sports. And to me, that is incredibly exciting. It changes the whole paradigm um, of what it means to be a, a sports, like a betting and gaming company and just a sports company in general. That was probably a much longer answer than you oh, was. It was a good answer. But I like the Spotify analogy because the, when I saw your CEO speak, I texted Russell afterwards. I said, that's it. Fanatics is the, they're the Spotify of sports betting. There's something going on here, you know, because they did such a unique job in the music business. And, and I saw it with the platform that you guys have, you know, with your parent yeah. company. And it's definitely starting to come together. I, I, I agree with you, right? Like, it's a great, it's an apt analogy. One of the things that makes, that made Spotify, I think, different than Pandora as well is Spotify started off as a technology company. Mm -hmm. They came at it as technologists, right. right? And I think a lot of betting and gaming companies, they really come at it as a betting and gaming company, right? It's a risk-based business, and engineering, while valuable, is still a cost center, right? Um, we've really come at this, like, and Matt's been an incredible advocate, and it's been, you know, every CTO's dream, not only to start a company from scratch, but it is a tech-first company. We're 67% of Fanatics Betting and Gaming is engineering. Um, we are an engineering and product-led organization, right, with a great design partner, and the business is there to enable technology to do cooler, better things. 
And that I think also was part of that ingredient for being able to like do something differently. We can rapidly develop um, because we have those resources. We are all that engineering first company. Um, and I think the law sort of component in there, a lot of the folks, well, they loved music, worked from the music industry in Spotify. They were really, truly technologists. Same here, we have about a 30-70 split. About 30% of the engineering population has a has history in sports books, which is necessary. You can't go in it blindly. Um, but the other 70% really has pulled, we pulled very heavy from like West Coast technology, like startups and juggernauts. So there's a lot of ex-Amazonians, Googlers, uh, Twitter or ex ex people, ex people. I don't know, Twitter people, Twitter tweeters, um, like all of that kind of fun stuff, as well as a lot of great startup companies. So some really spectacular technologists that have come in and they can look at this th these things with different eyes and be like. No, we don't need to build it like that. Let's build it like this. Um, this is far more modern. It's far more normal uh, in the industry and will scale far better than anything that's out there. So I think that also brings a lot of freshness to not only how the app looks and is used use for users, but its ability to be fast and secure and ultimately to be a platform that you can kind of hang anything you need to on top of it so the product can really kind of dream big and it can. And the fact that you, know, you kind of tied everything together to one fan ID. Uh, I mean, that's a, a big advantage. Like looking at, you know, like a, a Caesars or BetMGM, they also try to have some kind of point system, but good luck figuring out like how to book a room using your, you know, MGM points with one of the MGM properties. It, it, I walked through the process just to see like how intuitive it should be, <laughs> which was not completely. So, yeah. You know, that's one of the best things, the big reasons Fandle is, I think, very brave and just very open. They don't even try. They're like, yeah. we're not even going to put calories into this, right? Like, there's no point. Um, and I think, good for them. Like, they're being honest and putting their calories in where it matters, right? And I think that's what's making them number one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> you know, one of the um, things that, you know, we discussed previously was, you know, in order to kind of bring this vision to a product, uh, you had some decisions to make along the way. Uh, oh yeah, build a house. Do you acquire a platform? Do you do a hybrid? Talk a little bit about that thing. That this. Yeah, I mean, this this we literally started with nothing. Uh, an idea, a couple of engineers, um, and a lot of questions and a lot of decisions that need to be made. Right. And this kind of gets to the crux of it. Do you build? Do you buy? Do you hybridize? Do you what? What do you do? So, so you know, obviously, we'll see if I made the right decisions. Right, proofs in the pudding. We're still early days. Uh, I'm hoping uh, the pudding's going to come out and it's going to be delicious, and there'll be a lot of it. But we'll 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 definitely see. Um, but I think for me, I learned a few lessons along along the way to get to sort of this point. When I first started at Fangio. Uh, in order to get to market, FanDuel had partnered with a couple of providers, um, one provider for their account wallet solution, one provider for their sports betting platform, and one provider for their casino platform. And so everything was you know, outsourced. It was very software as a service. There's a small engineering team in-house to kind of tie everything together. But on the whole, it was mostly sort of a, a decision of buy um, and not even buy and own, but like buy and and have someone else operate. And a lot of operators go down that model. It's really efficient to get to market, you get to market very quickly using a Canby or a GAN or an IGT, and either all of them or a combination of those of those kind of like the big sort of providers. And Melco is another one. But you end up with a product that's really a skin. It's difficult to differentiate. It's difficult to customize. And look. No matter what your decision is, whether you're building something, you're buying something, um, you're integrating something, you're only going to get out as much as you're only going to get out as much as the effort that you put into that work, right? And so you see this all the time where someone has integrated or they've partnered or partnered with somebody to outsource something, and they don't put in the calories that they need internally to make this work, right? So you, and and that was factual, like. 
it just wasn't scaling, it wasn't working. And so we had to go through a complete replatforming exercise and Flutter was an amazing help because they gave us access to their code base, which we were then able to modify and make our own right at the time. So decisions that I had to make, platform, how are we going to go through this, right? Are we going to build it, buy it, do something? When I sat down and really looked at it, the concept of building from scratch, starting with a blank IDE and building from a nothing, like as appealing as that honest to God was, and that is really appealing, It's that's, that's so many years of development before we could finally get a product out, right? It was just too much runway. By the time we built what we wanted to build today and delivered it three years later, it wouldn't be what we needed or wanted anymore. Right, that that in this industry, the concept of we design something today and deliver it three years from now, we might as well deliver it in next century, right? Because it'll just be obsolete. So, as appealing as it was, never an option. After my experiences with you know using software as a service and buying in a platform, that also wasn't an option. So, the only option that we really had that made any sense of the core platform was to do a deal where we could buy a platform and buy with it the code base and then make it our own. And so we began that journey. It was not a diff not an easy journey. Though. Obviously, you can imagine a lot of providers that want to sell us a copy of their code base. Um, we ended up going with a Melco. Um, they have been great partners. They, from day one, um, they were very open and honest about their product. Um, you know, their product is designed to be a B2B product. And so we spent a year um, with a lot of engineers, a lot of calories spent making that product our own, refactoring it, cutting out the B2B work, really building a custom platform that I today can stand by and say, it, at its core, it's still on a Melco platform, but it is now so de-evolved from the Melco like, you know, sort of image that we no longer have a Melco engineers able to work within the code base anymore. So they've now stepped out and Melco is no longer assisting. It is 100% we are on our own uh, because the code base is just so amorphously different. Um, we've extended, we factored, we built, modernized, updated, changed things around. Again, because, you know, their platform had to be a B2B platform, right? So it had a lot of things that we just didn't really need. So, so that was a buy moment. Well, we did start. Well, that was a buy at build. So I guess that's a hybrid moment. Well, so was that to be a hybrid moment? Hybrid. Yeah, moment. exactly. It's, but it's called. We'll call that a hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a hybrid. A hybrid with a lot of work, a lot of building involved in that hybrid. <laughs> but from a from a front end perspective, we decided to start from scratch. We decided that if we couldn't, in good conscience, just skin a Melco's white label product. Right, we didn't want to buy in another product. We wanted to build something that was uniquely not only ours, but use modern technologies. And so we made the decision to build native, and then we also made a decision which was controversial at the time, and it's paid off well so far. And fingers crossed, it continues to pay off well. We decided to invest in uh, Kotlin multi-platform. So when we first started this journey, Kotlin was mostly used on Android devices. It was a multi-platform project for it to also be able to build and work with native um, iOS, uh, with the idea being you put all your business logic into Kotlin, and then you would extend out all the UI elements in the native code bases in both Android and uh, iOS, right? And it was not over the line. Um, it was still in beta with the, was the project. We decided to invest in it and help get it over the line uh, to make it a mature enterprise like, you know, like style, like project. And that was our sort of plan of record moving forward. So our app, we built from the ground up 100% in Kotlin and with native UI components. I truly believe a native experience is the only way to go. Don't get me wrong. Don't hate me with any React Native. I don't hate web views. But when you really want to have an experience that is super fast and reliable, you want to build native. So that was, for me, again, a no-brainer. There's been another bunch of other stuff that we've decided to partner with people. Let's just be clear. I'm not in the business of uh, building HRIS tools, right? I don't want to build one. If I wanted to build one, I go work at Salesforce. So I go work at you know, Oracle. Don't want to build one? Go partner with those guys. Go integrate one. Put the team together who's going to integrate it and own it 
to make that enterprise deployment ours again. You've got to invest in anything that you buy, right? Um, how do you think that you 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 rely on a vendor for? But once you make that investment, you do the right integration. You have a team there to continue to iterate on that integration and partner with that vendor. Um, makes perfect sense. Um, partner with Bet Genius, right? So like Genius, we're partnered with Genius. We've got the NFL stream out, um, so sort of in our products. Be one of the first people to market um, in time for um, NFL kickoff, uh, the NFL streaming product. Um, it's an amazing product. It's so fast. That stream is like four seconds behind the game. It's so fast that we, some of the days, we were actually having our traders trading off of our stream versus their trading stream because it was a little quicker. And so we, isn't that amazing? Yeah. And we were able to. And we were able to integrate with them because we partnered with them. We worked together as they were building the SDK and we built the solution. So that way we were ready for day one, right? Um, and the big operators, no shade on them. I know they've got other stuff they have to deal with and you know, more mature product, but you know they haven't integrated it. I remember four years ago when I first started in this business, I actually mentioned like, hey, when are we going to get NFL streaming in? And I was told it was never going to be possible. The NFL will never allow us to stream a game inside of the app. Here we are today with a nice partnership and integration. So, like, this is not a real answer. This is examples of sort of the decisions they've made. For me, I think what it comes down to is, am I in the business of building this piece of software? Right? It's, it's a question I ask myself as I go through the, like, build versus buy. Is this a core competency of my business? Well, an HRIS is not a core competency of my business, right? Financial reporting is a, something that my business has to do, but is it a core competency of what my business is about? No. I'm going to part with people who made it their core business, right? I'm not going to ever build my own streaming service. That's silly. I'm going to partner with someone who's going to stream to me in the NFL game, so I'm not going to do it myself. And that's fine, right? Because that's that's, I think... That's how you sort of maintain focus. Can't, if you build everything, you're going to screw yourself. You're going to have teams now owning tools that, you know, um, like analytics tools, but that's still amazing analytics products, right? Like, I love me some Datadog. Big shout out to the Datadog at Tableau and Snowflakes of the universe. I don't want to build that shit. So that's an easy one. You buy, you integrate, you partner with to make it the best it can be. When it comes to my core business, I want to own the technology. So where I can, I'm going to build it because I want to own it and I want to deeply own it and deeply stress about it. Because that's the only way to provide to my customers what my customers need. So I'm not going to go and use an auth service from somewhere else, right, for my fan ID. I'm going to build it in-house. I'm going to have teams and product people doing nothing but assessing, obsessing over, over fat ID and KYC and these other things that are friction points in my business that I need to be an expert in. And so I will always default to a build. And if if the time horizon to build is too long, I'm going to look to where I can buy and get a copy. Think of that as a cheat sheet and get that copy. And then I can just ax away at it, knock off all the shit that I don't need and make it exactly what I need it to be. Because I, I want that core experience to be very selfish. I want it to be very singular purpose, singular minded, and I want obsessive people to take ownership of it, right? And that that is, for me in a technology space, kind of my guiding principles on how to make an informed decision and kind of move forward from there. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> we like working in the uh, the build area, Daydart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sad oh, I mean, look, listen, you had a, we, had a, we had a relationship. You guys helped us something fierce during the replatforming project at Fangel, yeah. right? Like during that project, we took what was something that was designed to run in a big data set on bare metal that supported the European market in a single instance. And we had to convert that into something that would be run in a cloud environment that could operate multiple instances, right? Um, and truly be something that would be fit for purpose for the American market. And you guys came in and helped us a great deal with building out, 
with the DevOps side of the house, right? Like right. building out all of those pipelines, those build pipelines. It was an there was so much work to do. I'm sure it's a course of that, like eight cheap months. And you guys were a really big part of that. I and mean, then that's hence why we're chat today. But those data are calories. Well, good partner get us over that. I was that look, migrations are never fun. We platforming is one of the least fun things you could do. But I'll tell you, like that work set Fanjul up to be as successful as it is today, right? It was foundational. And sometimes it's the non sexy work that has the biggest impact. Yeah. Yeah. Well we're we're definitely good at rolling up our sleeves and making clients look good. <laughs> and we've been pretty successful at that. Yeah. So I mean that that's a lot of great insight. You know, thank you for that, Ian. Um, you know, it, it, it I'm sure it's not easy being in your shoes making decisions on, you know, who do we partner with versus what what do we build at house because there's like so much on the market, so much to evaluate. But you know, you coming from the background that you did, you know, seeing everything that Microsoft build, built during your time there, you know, Amazon grew exponentially during your time there. Um, you know, FanDuel became a stable, reliable product during your time there. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, qu quite a test. <laughs> you know, with that. I don't get it right. Thank you. I mean, it, it sounds a little bit, I mean, it, it, it's, Sometimes it's intuition, but I think a lot of the times it's, it really is like when you really distill it down, when you have to make some of these decisions, what I've noticed and when I see like, you know, sort of, you know, new leaders who are emerging, who are sort of put in some of these positions sort of about build or buy is they look for, for a silver bullet. They look to apply like a previous formula to a new universe. And what I've learned is you, you very much got to come in. Um, eyes wide open and take nothing for granted, right? Like when I came over here, like we were evaluating every tool that we were using. And it was like, well, let's not just choose pager duty because we have pager duty over at Fangio. Or I use pager duty at Amazon, right? Like what what let's go let's go check and see like what is the best on call tool that we should be using, right? We made the decision again that like, hey, page duty is still it, like we mood source, right? But these are the decisions that you, if, if you if you take it for granted, you're going to get bit at some point, right? And yeah. that to me, like I think, is one of the sort of the gifts that I've 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 been given some sort of very early on. And Amazon was very good about doing this to me. Um, was hey, like challenge every assumption. Don't go in with a bias and an assumption. Go in with a problem statement, a customer forward problem statement. And then go evaluate what you need for your team, for your customer, right? Um, specifically, and then make that determination. And sometimes you'll find it's the same old, same old. Other times you might find, you know, hey, there's actually been something way better sitting over here. It was developed in a garage by a couple of people, right? Um, or some other competing product has just made a leaps and bounds improvement. And so that's where you really want you want to partner with. Um, and 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 I'm I'm fully in right and and that mindset I think really helps us, you know, um, stay fresh and and gives us a, a point of view that is maybe a little bit different than uh, the how sort of other companies approach the same problem space. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Ross, we can yeah. do uh, with Ian. You know, we may have to do a part two. <laughs> yeah, it's <that's laughs> point of way long. Yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. No, no, that, that's perfect. Um, uh, Kevin, you no, I just you know in in looking at kind of wrapping things up a little, a little bit because we could talk all day. You know, you started talking about fanatics. You know, the company. You know, you're part of Fanatic Sports Betting. We got to see Maddie speak at G2E and see what she's doing in the AI world using AI to predict problematic gamblers, which I thought was important, and she wants to be transparent about that. You also told us a little bit about what parent company is doing moving forward, you know, to help in the big world, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So super exciting. So depending on when this comes out, this will be a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, uh, the power of uh, the internet. But uh, Fanatics, I think, as the company is mature, um, I think it's now time to sort of look about how do we make a social impact. Um, and Fanatics has decided um, to partner with Make-A-Wish Foundation in a sort of a first-of-its-kind partnership. 
uh, which will see fanatics support all sports related wishes for the wish granting organization in both the US and Canada. Um, fanatics is contributing $10 million um, contribution um, and in kind donations to provide ass assistance and needed help to close the gap in the number of sports wishes that are being waited to be granted. As you can imagine, so many kids want to meet their sports heroes. You know, they want to participate in sports and don't have the opportunity. Um, so, with more than 900 sports partnerships um, and exclusive contracts with hundreds and hundreds of top tier athletes, um, Fanatics is sort of uniquely positioned to be able to create really, really incredible experience for these kids um, and their families, right? Who go through so much supporting them. So this includes supporting uh, life-changing wishes um, specific to athlete meet and greets, attending games, and special events. So in addition to supporting wish granting, Fanatics will also provide Make-A-Wish with in-kind donations um, from certain merchandise that we all over, as you can imagine, the media and whatnot. Um, and the partnership kicked off in New York City, 24th of October, um, and featuring some pretty big sports icons like Tom Brady, Aaron Judge, and of course the always popular Jason Tatum. So I'm super excited. Um, there's a group of super wishes getting ready to happen. So like big tear jerking moments. Um, you know, this is I think the first step in you know sort of fanatics as as a whole, um, giving back to the sort of community for everything that it's it's made us be today, right? And um, it's kind of be a bit bigger part of the the fabric of. North America and society. So I'm, I can't be more proud than to have this announcement. I can't be more proud um, of the company for sort of stepping in and leveraging what is really a set of unique relationships with the players in the league. So I think we're going to see a lot of stuff. Um, hopefully, I get to be part of some of them. Um, though they should be warned, I am a super super soppy guy. So um, I uh, I will be uh, tearing up like. And sometimes I just talk about it and I start crying. Uh, so it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, great cause. And um, yeah, a, a lot of those, uh, uh, you know, make a wish request you know, are for, you know, athletes. So um, yeah, I think uh, you'll definitely make an impact and, you know, put it even more in the map than it is today. So so that that is it's a great, great. It's a really great organization. Um, so yeah, I had a, I had a friend of mine who's a child of leukemia and make a wish, uh, was awesome to them. Uh, and good news. She's a uh, cancer free and, uh, is now a body, body 17 year old. So, um, and that is a distant memory and hopefully a forever memory ago, but make a wish is such a great place. Cool. You know, some of these kids, man, they, they fight so hard. They're some of the bravest people on earth. So Neil, that's another reason why I like working here. Yeah. <laughs> well thank you for joining us this has really been like i said we have to do part two and then we'll yeah, yeah we'll, we'll hang out some more in the future Andy on. Well, yeah, we'll have Andy on and then at some point in the future you'll have to ask me uh if any of these decisions panned out oh yeah oh we'll be fine no don't worry <laughs> and i'm also curious about the star trek conventions i've never attended one <laughs> hear about that oh, I, the last one I, I got it i got a tattoo Little uh, Klingon, uh, Klingon uh, symbol. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Your choice if you want to dress up as one of your favorite characters on the next one. That's up to you. We oh, it's too much makeup. Up. Turning me into a Klingon thing. <laughs> All here on the data. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for your time. All right, cheers. Yeah.